grim, isn't it? It's enough to make one shudder. But I'll tell you, gang, it only serves to remind us of that other mathematical instrument which is used and has the same results, if you will. That is to say, a test of hypothesis. When you run a test of hypothesis, what comes out is a final decision, a black or white answer. If you set up a hypothesis about a particular value for the parameter, uh, gather your data and test the hypothesis, only two things can happen. You either end up believing the hypothesis and grasping it to your bosom, or you spurn the hypothesis. You banish it forever, forever and ever from that point on in time. You do not admit it into your mind's eye. You either end up believing it or believing it to be completely false. And there's no intermediate area between these two uh, views. There's no grays of any kind. Now, it's not very often, really, in the practice of engineering that you get an opportunity to run a test of hypothesis in real, you know, practice. The one outstanding example, though, is in quality control, because if you get large batches of, uh, ma of uh, material coming into your plant or onto your floor, and you take a sample of those items and you uh, check them out and run a test of hypothesis, you have to decide on the basis of the sample information whether you're going to send the blooming stuff back to the manufacturer or whether you're going to admit it into the plant and use it in your production process. So here is an illustration where you could, you know, accept or reject. In this case, you accept or reject the batch of material. But in the larger world that we're all aware of, where we have to try to learn something about what in the devil is going on, what is Mother Nature doing to me right now? What is the true response? What can I find out about this process, about this mechanism that I'm dealing with? And when you're, when you're dealing with a situation where you're trying to learn something about a parameter, then you're not in a set of circumstances which lead to a test of hypothesis. Quite the contrary. Under those circumstances, you're out to make estimates, and in particular, interval estimates for the parameters. This is the important idea, the important thing that we attempt to do over and over again in statistics. We're trying to learn what's going on. And we recognize that when we take the data, the data are suffering from a variability which keeps us from seeing exactly what is behind, what the real truth is. And so we have to deal in gradations of belief, if you will, as to what we think is going on in the light of our data even though our data are, unfortunately, a rather sometime thing on occasion. Well, let's talk a little bit more about test of hypotheses. Let's limit this lecture to one that concerns linear statistics. And if you wanted to make a test of a hypothesis about a parameter which you could estimate using linear statistic, you'll all remember, I trust, that what you'd end up uh, using in this case is the normal deviant. You would get the statistic that estimates the parameter. You divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic and calculate z. And if you wanted to see that in slightly more algebraic form, that's easily made available. <clears throat> There's a linear statistic. You take each observation, multiply it by a constant, sum up that mess. That's your statistic. It estimates a parameter. The estimate, the expected value of that statistic is the parameter. Then you divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic. And that's always some constant times sigma squared, where sigma squared is the variance of the observations. And the constant is the sum of the AI squares. Okay, let's make our problem uh, more detailed still. Let's consider a problem which we're dealing with a, a mean and we've collected some data and we've determined the average and we want to test a hypothesis about the mean. And under that circumstance, the average is a linear statistic. The expected value of the average is the mean and downstairs we divide by the square root of sigma squared over n. There's the constant in front of uh, sigma squared, the variance of the observations. We would compute c. Okay, now if we had also been in a situation where we collected data and we wanted to make an interval statement about what we thought the mean to be, of course the point estimate would be the statistic. That's the best blooming estimate of the parameter, but it's called a point estimate. And what we want is an interval estimate, a region in which we can, in a sense, feel comfortable with values of the parameter. And so if we wanted to make an interval statement for a parameter, we'd have to use its statistic, the statistic that estimates the parameter. And the limits of that interval would be given by the point estimate, plus or minus 1.96. That's the uh, critical value. The critical value of z, which leaves 2.5% in the tails of the curve. 1.96 times the square root of the variance of the statistic. And just to illustrate what those limits look like uh, algebraically, you'd have your statistic, and here would be the variance of the statistic right here. Okay? And once again, if we were in our problem in which we were dealing with the um, 
average and uh, trying to use the average to estimate the mean, uh, our particular problem would uh, become this one. <clears throat> we wanted to make an interval estimate for the mean. The limits of that interval would be given by the average plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of the variance of the statistic. So here we have the confidence interval statement for the parameter. And previously, we discussed the problem of getting an interval. I uh, actually discussed the problem of getting a test of hypotheses uh, for a specific value of the parameter. OK, well, about now, we ought to uh, get some data so we can get off the ground. And um, let's think of some data. Let's see now. Hmm. 36, 24, 36. <laughs> I <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, I recall now. Um, yes. That was the afternoon that we were out uh, collecting the, um, the data on the, um, on the charge on the golf cars. That's what that was all about. And we were trying the 36, 24, 36, uh, 26, and 28. And uh, we were out recording the uh, charge left in the batteries after the completion of uh, two rounds of golf. Uh, that was a, a very interesting... Uh, uh, data collection exercise. We had to play 10 rounds of golf to get all the data. And uh, of course, our problem now was to make uh, some sort of statement about what was going on relative to the charge remaining after the completion of two rounds of golf. And uh, so how did we proceed? Now, first thing we have to do in this case, of course, is to co compute the average. And so here you see us taking the five observations. This is percent charge remaining at the conclusion of two rounds of golf, five times. The total is 150 and the average is 30. And the number of observations is equal to five. Okay, now let's do a test of hypothesis. You remember that the standard batteries that have been used left 28% of charge at the conclusion of two rounds of golf. So let's test the hypothesis that the mean is equal to 28 given our present information to wit that the average is equal to 30. Okay, let's go do that particular calculation. Well, now the uh, hypothesis is that the mean is 28. The originating hypothesis, the null hypothesis, that A is equal to 28. And where do we stand in our calculation? Well, Y bar was 30, A is 28, N were five observations, but uh-oh, what about sigma squared? And by golly, I don't know what sigma squared is. Now, in the example we did earlier, I played like Mother Nature and I told you sigma squared. But here's a situation where, what in the devil will I use for sigma squared? Okay, gang, what do you say we engineer this problem? What would any uh, engineer do in this case? He'd say, well, let's get the best guess for sigma squared and stuff it in and turn the crank and see what happens. And so this would lead me to put in the estimate of the variance, S squared. Okay. Now, the minute I put in S squared there, this expression no longer equals Z because, you know, S squared is an estimate of sigma squared. And, you know, as an estimate, sometimes it's large and sometimes it's smaller than sigma squared. So this quantity no longer equals Z. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to reserve the symbol T for this particular quantity. So this is called the T statistic. And it behooves us now to discuss the T statistic and particularly to spend a little time uh, talking about the gentleman who is responsible for studying and deriving, if you will, uh, that particular uh, statistic. This gentleman's name is uh, W.S. Gossett. However, uh, I want you to remember his name, Gossett. However, the T distribution, which he was responsible for, does not bear his name. It's called student's T statistic. And this gives rise to a very interesting story. Uh, Gossett was the brewmaster for Guinness Stout in Northern Ireland. And uh, sort of his uh, avocation was, um, was statistics. And he would do problems in statistics, work problems. But when he attempted to publish, he found out that the uh, organization would not uh, permit him to publish under his own name. And so he devised the, the following sort of gimmick. He would uh, write the letters to the philosophical societies, or if you will, papers, and he'd say, um, a problem, for example. What is the distribution of the statistic T, which I obtain when I substitute S squared for sigma squared? So it would be the question he'd raise, and then he'd work out the answer, you see. And when he got through to the bottom of the paper, he'd merely sign it, a student. And so it became known as students statistic. And actually student, or really I should say Gossett, student is responsible for a great many important papers in the practice and the theory both of statistics. Well, unfortunately, student died uh, very uh, early in his uh, productive life, and um, the statisticians of the world got together after uh, uh, he died, 
and uh, put together his papers. And what do you think they did when they published uh, W.S. Gossett's papers? Do you think Gossett gets his name uh, on, the, on the book? The uh, editors get their name on the, uh, on the heading of the book and so on, but uh, of course Gossett doesn't. It's called Students Collected Papers, and you don't really know that uh, this uh, text has anything at all to do with uh, W.S. Gossett until you open the pages and start reading and the, the foreword and so on. So his memory actually is, uh, is encased in statistics through the, his, his <laughs> pseudonym, student. Okay, what do you say we have a look at what the T distributions are like? Here's a collection of T distributions. T is a bell-shaped curve very much like the normal, except there are a whole bunch of T distributions. There's a different T distribution for every setting of the degrees of freedom. We're going to reserve again the letter nu for degrees of freedom. Here's T with one degrees of freedom, with one degree of freedom right here. You see, it looks like a normal, except it's sort of slumped down in the center. It's a little higher in the tails of the curve, higher than the normal. And so there's T with one. Underneath there, you ought to be able to pick out T with five degrees of freedom. Beginning to look a great deal like the normal, see? But once again, it's lower in the center than the normal and higher in the tail. There's a long tail distribution, actually. There's the normal as nu approaches infinity, then the t distribution approaches that of the normal distribution. Of course, s squared, the statistic, would approach sigma squared. And so t approaches the normal as the number of degrees of freedom increases. Okay, just for a moment, let's have a look at the mathematical form of the uh, t statistic. Uh, you see that here. This is the the distribution which uh, is used to tabulate the critical values of t and what have you. And you'll notice in this distribution the role of the symbol nu. It's a one parameter distribution. You tell me what nu is, if nu were five or six or what have you, then that particular mathematical form would generate uh, the distribution we're dealing with. Okay, gang, now let's return to uh, our problem for a minute and uh, do this uh, uh, test of significance we were dealing with, except now uh, we're gonna take advantage of the um, of um, the T statistic.